last 150 years or so, there's been a number of vehicles with onboard water decomposition devices that have powered the vehicle and appear to defy accepted scientific principles. Just how this is possible is still open to speculation. It is my intention here to shed some light on the subject of onboard water separation as a fuel and to try and establish if such systems are commercially feasible for automotive applications. John Keeley in the late 19th century demonstrated by acoustic means a method of separating water into its constituent parts with no more energy input than the pluck of a few musical wires attached to a container partly filled with water. Unfortunately, Keeley's processes were not commercialised and many of his secrets have been lost. Keeley did reveal, however, that water was easily separated by applying one or more specific harmonic chords throughout the water sample. Notably, these frequencies were 620 hertz to break down the molecular cluster, 620 plus 630 hertz to separate H2O, and 620 plus 630 plus 12,000 hertz to further reduce the gases to the etheric. And by etheric, I assume, Keeley means subatomic. And this was in an 1888 uh, Liberator, that was the name of the device. But in his disintegrator, which was a later device, the frequency was approximately 42 kilohertz. So I wouldn't hold your breath on those frequencies. It depends on the configuration of the particular cell. As I said before, this is a trial and error basis to try and find these frequencies. A similar process may be applied to an electrolytic cell containing water by varying the pulses of the applied electrical energy. Henry Puriak demonstrated this principle in his US patent. The pulses he used were alternating current, whereas Faraday uses direct current exclusively. Alternatively, by using DC pulses in an electrolytic process, the gas yield can be considerably improved. The process involves pulse width modulation of the applied energy by varying the duration of the pulses and the timing between each pulse. The ideal gas production is arrived at empirically by observing the gas output or automatically by a suitable feedback circuit. First of all, you've got to observe it empirically before you can design a feedback circuit. The frequency and duration of these pulses appears to be different for each size and design of cell. It is believed the duration of the pulses is determined by the time it takes for the ions in the liquid to move from one electrode to the other. The duration between each pulse train appears to be necessary to allow the accumulated gases at the electrodes to be released. In addition, it is possible that some of the gases released by pulsing may be in the hydrogen hydroxide state, HOH, or hydroxy for short, uh, thereby conserving energy for use in its intended exothermic application within the engine. As I said before, you can save 18,000 kilojoules per mole, 900 from the electrolyzer going up to HOH gas, and another 900 because it doesn't have to go from the diatomic stage to the monotogen before it becomes steam. Um, when straight DC is used, it normally requires a higher level of energy to separate the gas bubbles from the plates, as atomic hydrogen needs to gain two electrons to acquire the H2 status. When pure distilled or deionized water is used in the cell as the only medium, the medium has such a high dielectric constant, which in other words is resistance, of 78 to 81 times that of air, that the process can no longer be regarded as electrolysis. In electrolysis, the process involves the transfer of ions in a conductive medium. But when the water molecule is shattered by resonance and or high electrical potential, then disassociation comes about by brute force reaction and not ionization. 
Because the water molecule reacts to a magnetic influence, it may be possible to use either permanent magnets or electromagnets to assist in the water separation process. Although this effect is well known, its application in the separation of water has received little attention in the development of the art. Horvath, who was a, an inventor in Sydney, centred his invention around an electromagnet in his earlier patents and used gamma radiation across a bath of water gases in his later patent. Hasabi, who is a Japanese inventor in his patent, used permanent magnetic effects in the water separation process. But he is the only one who has claimed an output of gas greater than the Faraday benchmark. And these patents I'll be discussing in a little bit later. There has been many different approaches made to separate water into its constituent gases. In order to take advantage of the explosive nature when recombining. Acoustics, optics, heat and chemical reaction. High voltage, low voltage, direct current, alternating current, pulse, stretched, radiated, magnetically intensified, recirculated and aerated all have been used to attack H2O. The best of these I've singled out and we will analyse now. The first one we're going to talk about is Francisco Pacheco. He's a Bolivian who moved to America at the uh, offer of President Wallace. Uh, Pacheco developed a cell that not only generated hydrogen without the supply of energy, but it produced his own electricity as a byproduct. He demonstrated the device operating an internal combustion engine motor mower to Vice President Wallace of the United States in 1943 when he went to Bolivia. Uh, we'll have a look at that device now. Over here at the top is his first patent. If you remember, I said he first demonstrated that in 1943-1945. His first patent he didn't do until 72, and another patent in 92, just before he died. Uh, this device over here is an electrolytic process. It uses salt water. Sodium chloride is in this container, mixed with water. This electrode here, Mark 15, is a carbon electrode. The electrode over here, Mark 16, is magnesium. This external circuit here, when this switch is closed, will generate electricity. And the cost for generating that electricity is the breakdown of the magnesium positive electrode. When that breaks down, it releases hydrogen. Hydrogen, positive ions, then go over to the uh, carbon electrode because of gravity, it goes upwards into this reserve tank here for use in the internal combustion engine. Over here, we have my diagram representing his 92 patent of four separate cells. What happens in this particular device, it also uses sodium chloride, uses salt water, 9% mix, I think, by volume, if I remember rightly. The electricity that is generated by this system, when this circuit is closed, the same as this circuit up here, operates this pump which circulates the electrolyte. As the electrolyte circulates, the gas that is generated, the hydrogen gas that is generated, comes up here into this top uh, container here which is known as a bubbler. A bubbler is used to prevent flashback, which is when it combusts, when the gas combusts, to stop the explosion getting back into the cells and destroying everything. So the explosive force will only go to the surface of the liquid in the bubbler. The hydrogen, by gravity, of course, goes off this way. The electrolyte comes down through this heat exchanger and filter. It needs a heat exchanger because these cells get very hot as they break down uh, the chemical reaction with the metal. They also have a lot of contaminants, so it needs to be cleaned out by this process. The green is the same as this one. The green is magnesium. Uh, this is a concentric cell. They are tubes. The, the middle one, of course, is a bar or rod that goes in the middle. Next comes this little yellow, which you can hardly see. There's a little yellow stripe down there. That's an ion exchange membrane. It is made 
of asbestos material, and asbestos is the very best material you can use for an exchange membrane in any type of cell, whether hot or cold, because it doesn't mix with the chemical reaction within the cell. I don't care what it does to your health, it does very well inside a cell. Outside to that, as you can see here from the legend, that's aluminium, external to it. That's a tube of aluminium. Hydrogen is produced by both electrodes, both of the magnesium and of the aluminium, external to it. Tonight we're going to have to assess each one of these systems, and in order to assess them we need to have sort of some basis by which we can assess them. Different devices have a different sort of assessments because we try and use the same terminology the inventors used to defeat him or support him in his own particular uh, method of approach. In this case we're using the kilojoule value, the energy value of petrol. We made it nice and easy this time. We're going to do 100 kilometres an hour. So in one hour we're going to do 100 kilometres, providing we stick to that 100 kilometres. We're going to use 10 kilometres per litre of fuel. So this is a, a nice, easy mental calculation. Clearly, we're going to use 10 litres in that one hour. And if each of those litres has an energy value, somewhere around here, 29,400 kilojoules, uh, this was some time ago before we improved our petrol. Uh, so it's at 29,400 kilojoules for this particular exercise. Multiplied by 10, mental arithmetic again, is 290,000 kilojoules of energy for that one hour trip. If now we're going to use magnesium for the same trip, we're going to need again 294,000 kilojoules of energy for that one hour trip uh, using the Pacheco cell. You don't need to be a chemist to understand what I'm about to tell you here. One mole of magnesium weighs 24.31 grams. One mole of hydrogen weighs 2.015 grams. One mole of magnesium will generate one mole of hydrogen. The amount of hydrogen needed to generate that 290,000 kilojoules, basing it on this, uh, this is a gas... Uh, kilojoule value, this is not a water kilojoule value as we used before. Uh, so dividing that in, we find that we've got 1,286.25 moles of hydrogen. And that weighs 2.6 kilograms. Uh, actually quite a substantial weight considering how light hydrogen is that you would use in that one hour trip. And for every 2.015 grams of hydrogen, remember this is a one-for-one one relationship, one mole of magnesium, one mole of hydrogen. Therefore, in magnesium we must burn 1,286.25 moles of magnesium. Uh, multiplying that out by 24.31 grams for each mole, we find we need 31.27 kilograms of magnesium. We're going to burn a huge amount of magnesium in one hour and at $12.66 a kilogram, that's going to cost you 400 bucks to go 100 kilometres. We've got a marvellous invention here. This is his second patent. Even if this produced twice the amount of hydrogen, which it doesn't, it's still going to cost 200 bucks to do the same trip. 10 litres at $1.40 a litre, still at the moment, not quite $1.50, 14 bucks, I'd rather use petrol. Quite simple. So even though this device does operate a vehicle, it's totally uneconomical. Not only that, you've got 31 kilograms of magnesium being consumed in one hour. You're going to have one end of a job cleaning that out the filter and returning it back to its normal system. So it's not going to be easy to operate because you've got to change all these cells all the time. So commercially it's not viable, it's not even reliable because once you start breaking up these chemicals they're going to start causing some problems within the cell. So even though this particular unit does drive a vehicle very admirably, it's absolutely useless. Okay, and I don't know why he persisted for so long, all his life. Well he did get to migrate to America didn't he, in Bolivia. 
Okay, the next one we're going to put up on the board. I better a little, little bit of talking and let that cool down a bit. In 1977, Yule Brown painted a process, and his uh, an inventor that was in Sydney also. Uh, we've got an awful lot of Australians that seem to be on top of the tree. Whereby he connected a hydrolyzer in a series configuration with terminals on each end plate, and as we discussed before, by shielding the edges of the electrode plates from the electrolyte in the cell, he was able to force the current to pass from one cell to the other in series without any wiring connected the internal plates. Both sides of each plate were utilised in a bipolar arrangement, one side of each plate acting as a cathode and the opposite side acting as an anode. So we just sort of used that by way of revision and we spoke about that before. Brown patented the device of 120 cells using a potential of 240 volts with and consumed 15 amps resulting in an input of 3,600 watts. By this arrangement he demonstrated his system's equality to a single cell of 2 volts potential requiring 1,800 amps to attain the same input of 3,600 watts and the same output of gas. With a current of only 15 amps, the bipolar system is commercially practical and eliminates the need for a huge transformer as well as creating a compact cell. Brown was not the first to come up with this idea as William Rhodes painted an almost identical cell some 10 years before. Although the combined gases will not self-ignite below an ignitiation arc of 570 degrees Celsius and 6 microjoules of energy, there is still considerable danger of flashback along the supply line or electrostatic arcs that could ignite the gas in any storage system that may be used. The use of flashback prevention devices is therefore essential for storage type applications, but it may not be practical where engine vacuum is used for direct gas extraction. This wasn't invented as an automotive system, it was actually invented to operate a welder, but it's a very good cell for using on vehicles as well as a supplementary system. This is the device as he put in the patent. This area contained under number 70 is exactly the same as the Rhodes patent and by rights Brown should have never received a patent for his particular device because it was all done by Rhodes. What Brown did was add this little bit on the end uh, to that particular device. Up the top is the welding torch. Uh, in this area here, 83, is contained some ceramic balls which also act as a flashback arrester. They are about one quarter of a millimetre in diameter. And as soon as they, uh, there's an arc that flies, flashes back in this little bit here, they tend to stop explosion from moving down the tube back into the cell. What happens here is this device here is known as an automatic switch, according to Brown. The top cone-shaped device is attached to this wire here which is supplying 240 volts RMS uh, DC voltage at 15 amps to this triangular device here at the top. The bottom triangular device, the nested device that's below that, is connected to the plates of the cell. Clearly this liquid here, if there is some liquid between these two cones, and that liquid is conductive, then electricity will pass into the cell. If for some reason there's a blockage and the gas is still being produced, then it will collect in this area here, gradually push down this liquid. Because this is exposed, number 82 is exposed to the outside atmosphere, the liquid is then pushed up here. This liquid now leaves this dry, high and dry, and the cell is automatically turned off. Absolutely beautiful device. The only trouble is, this is an explosive liquid. And seeing as you're putting 240 volts of 15 amps across there, it's going to set off an arc. So this is a disaster waiting to happen. So what he should have done 
was to put a little trip device in here. This wouldn't have been an explosive gas area. It would have been out in the outside atmosphere. It would have been so easy to trip it from here. So obvious. We need to assess this in order to find out how efficient this system is. As I said before, Yule Brown produces 1,866.6 litres of gas for each litre of water electrolysed. It takes 18.006 grams of water to produce 24.8 litres of H2 plus 12.4 litres of O2, being a total of 37.2 litres at standard atmospheric temperature and pressure. Without having to go through the calculation, we simply see here one litre of water produces 55.5 moles of water. If we electrolyse that, we could produce 2,065 litres of gas at 100% efficiency. So at 90.4% volumetric efficiency, because he produces only 18.66, it's very good production of gas. 90.4, almost 100% conversion. But volumetric efficiency is not very important. What we really want to know is how much energy we need to put in for the output of gas. So Brown claimed up here that one kilowatt hour produces 340 litres of H2O gas. Without going through all the calculation, I'll merely say that at 100% efficiency, you could produce 468.53 total litres of gas for one kilowatt of energy using the Faraday calculation. Consequently, his thermal efficiency is 72.57%. Not bad, actually. There's a lot of cells much less than that, so that's pretty good efficiency. How many intelligent people we got in the audience? That's all of you, is it? All intelligent. Can anybody see anything wrong with this cell design that uh, was put into Electronics Australia in January 1978 when they did a three- or four-page article on Newell Brown? They said this was his cell. Can anybody see anything wrong with that design? Have a look at the cell. What, how is it connected? Parallel. It's in parallel connection. It's not a series connection. You realise that if the comparison for this, you would have to put 1,800 amps across that supply, not 15 amps. You would have a wire as thick as your arm to carry that sort of power. And it would melt this whole thing down in about five minutes. You can see how efficient this system is compared to this. They both put out the same amount of gas, but this one only draws 15 amps. Very, very good. So it's a good cell to put on your car as a supplementary device, and that's why I put it up there. And nobody ever picked that up. I never saw any bit of retraction about that whatsoever. Next thing I'm going to talk about, the Joe cell. Some of you know about that, some of you don't. Uh, in about 1992, uh, Joe built this little device out of uh, some scrap that he got from the scrapyard out of stainless steel. It consisted of a tube with another tube inside that was perforated, both made out of stainless steel. One was a cathode, one was the anode. He had a bit of perspex on one end of this long tube and he connected his electrodes from the other end. When he connected this to his vehicle, he put it in front of the car on a trestle, on a wood trestle. And when he disconnected the petrol uh, from the carburetor, when he connected this particular cell, uh, to the battery and saw there was a whole lot of white froth inside it, he found that the car was still operating. And according to him, even when he turned the ignition off, it was still operating. And that's how the Joe cell was started. Uh, as he progressed, he finished up using three basic cells. He does something different from other people. What he does is charge, what he calls charging the water before he even puts it into the car cell. For this, he uses a stainless steel beer keg with the top cut off with a number of electrodes in it. And what he does is he charges this water over and over and over again. He uses, according to him, this is pure water. No, it isn't. It's water out of a creek, and it's highly conductive, is it not? You got some water from his creek, did you not? It's highly conductive. So he doesn't need to put a catalyst into that particular water. It's drained off of every farm and every property around the area into the local creek. Nothing special about the water at all. 
just highly conductive. As he charges this water up, it releases certain chemicals into the water, not only from the uh, stainless steel electrodes themselves, but from chemicals within the water. So he gets a whole lot of mess within the water, a cloudy sort of muck. If you stick your finger in it, it'll sink to the bottom. Uh, then he takes the clean water from the top, but before he does that, he sets light to the bubbles that come off of this cell as he charges it with a 12-volt battery or a 12-volt simulation uh, system. He ignites those bubbles, and they try to pull his ears out of his socket. He said, this water is charged. He puts this into his car cell, turns on the ignition, and away he goes. The car runs by his particular cell that he puts on the car. Between 1997 and 1999, I carried out a series of tests of the various configurations of the Joe cell design, as revealed in my book, The Joe Phenomenon, published by New Tech and available here tonight if you want it. I did not test any of these cells in a vehicle because I didn't have a vehicle, suitable vehicle for testing at that time. Due to other commitments, the research was abandoned following the bench tests, uh, mainly because I couldn't figure out what was actually pushing those pistons down. Joe underwent the most vigorous scrutiny to ensure that the petrol line was disconnected from the vehicle's carby when he demonstrated the vehicle's drivability. Unfortunately, nobody can confirm that the cell's output did not have a direct access to the car's input manifold. It is indeed difficult to come to terms with Joe's statement that the output of the cell need only be connected to a blank extrusion on the carburetor, not even into the carburetor. If Joe's claims are to be believed, then the only explanation for the phenomenon is some manifestation of an elusive and mysterious energy source such as zero point or orgone energy as claimed by Alex Schiffer. As I've said before, I do not believe for one second that orgone energy, zero point energy or any other subtle form of energy is capable of pushing down those pistons. The only way I can justify the operation of the engine is to conclude that it must be supplied with a combustible fuel mixture. How else could it generate the necessary heat in the time available? You've got one twentieth, one uh, one hundred and twentieth to one two hundred and fortieth of a second at normal speeds of an engine to get that fuel into the engine. A very, very short period of time. Even with the widest stretch of the imagination, it would be impossible to transmit sufficient fuel of any type into an internal combustion engine through a thick, solid aluminium barrier in the time allowed. I am not saying that you can't put hydrogen through aluminium. I'm simply saying you can't put it through the aluminium in the time allowed to get it into that engine. If such a device as a Joe cell were capable of providing the energy in conjunction with the air to power a vehicle, then it must have direct communication with the input manifold. Only under these circumstances would there be sufficient perturbation from the engine's vacuum and vehicle vibration to release the gas. With a 12-volt supply, engine vacuum and transfer of heat from the surrounds to allow the application, the action and reaction to proceed would there be at least some modicum of plausibility? The cell test revealed no insight into the mystery. Gas production of all the Joe cells showed classical scientific and electrolytic outcomes. It should be pointed out the vacuum was not applied to the cell in any of these experiments, and I didn't weigh the water to determine if there had been any change in the mass before the charge and after the charge. Right, there is, however a process that I think is happening here. And I haven't come across any other process uh, that has some plausibility in the explanation of the Joe cell. First of all, you might say that he's a total fraud. And there's a possibility that he is. Uh, but we've had too many people who've operated vehicles using similar cells. The process of electrolysis 
is one method used to generate heavy water. And as I said before, it contains deuterium or deuterium, some people like to call it. It is therefore possible that Joe may have unknowingly generated excess deuterium in his beer keg hydrolyzer before putting it into the car cell. And that's quite possible. Because if you charge it over and over again, this is how the Germans made heavy water. Exactly the same process. If the cell does have excess deuterium, it is possible that only minuscule amounts of gas in the engine could generate huge amounts of energy by creating helium. The Horvath experiments using enriched hydrogen in an internal combustion engine showed 350% higher levels of helium in the exhaust than was introduced into the manifold. This same experiment showed large gains in thermal efficiency of the radiated hydrogen that Horvath used. So it is more than possible that maybe some less hydrogen uh, actually combined in the deuterium form into helium and you don't need much. The transmutation process for helium, 8 by 10 to the minus 9 joules, which is 8 nanojoules per pair of deuterium atoms. 8 nanojoules per pair of deuterium atoms. It doesn't take many of those to come up to 32 kilojoules per litre of hydrogen that you may be using. And it's quite possible that that's how he's running his vehicle. All right, for those who don't know anything about the Joe Cell, and I don't think there are many people here tonight who don't know something about it, we'll put his cell up here just for point of interest. That's the Joe car cell. He also has the keg cell. I have not showing that tonight. Uh, as you see here, it's made out of 316 stainless steel. That stainless steel goes through an annealing process so as to take the stress out of all the bends and welds in this particular system. And he does that because he doesn't want any paramagnetism happening whilst the cell is operating. Uh, the outside tube is actually the positive anode electrode. Uh, that's connected via a switch to the battery. The top of the cell is actually just uh, put on loosely with Sikaflex sealing it so as that no gas escapes from the cell. The reason for doing this is if there's some reason it builds up a gas pressure inside, then the top will fly off rather than exploding the cell. The centre tube here, this is his concentric, of course, the system that's cut down the middle. The centre tube is the cathode. That is bolted to the floor of the car and insulated from the anode, of course. There are two other tubes, concentric tubes, in this cell. Uh, Joe calls them neutral plates. In this case, they're not neutral cylinders. They're not connected to anything. Uh, my experiments show they were absolutely useless. I just got the same amount of gas if I had that one there and that on the outside. I found that these didn't work at all. As a matter of fact, the electricity probably went from there to there without even going through these systems. So in my experiments, I don't know about other people's, uh, but I would have done just as good if there were two electrodes. The two electrode system was used by another one who claimed to have a... somebody else who claimed to have had a car running. His name was Carl Sellers. He only used two electrodes. He claimed to have this device in his boot that operated a vehicle. And there was an article in Nexus a couple of years, two or three, maybe five years ago now, was it? Related to the Sellers system. The next one is going to be something probably worthwhile doing. The reason I use probably because we don't know what's happening here either. Archie Blue. Archie Blue converted a number of vehicles in four different countries during the 1970s using a parallel connected electrode system, a 12 volt battery supply, 10 grams of sodium hydroxide per litre of water and a pump normally used to blow up airbags. Okay, uh, up here we can see uh, the Leyland Mini, one of the Leyland Minis that he converted in the island of Guernsey. Following him is an RAC engineer who could confirm everything that the chap who was driving this car uh, did over a two-day period. The Leyland Mini was pictured in 1978 by Michael Kemp and he was a motoring expert of the British newspaper, which was the Sunday Mirror. 
First of all, he went over to the island, and unfortunately, Archie Blue blew this pump over here. He had to go home again. He came back in two weeks later, and he ran that car for two days solid uh, before he blew another pump, and that sent him back home again. So Kemp drove this at an average speed of 56 kilometres per hour around the island, but a bit lighter in England, they did a 160 uh, kilometre an hour test on another vehicle. Uh, Archie Blue can be seen over here. You can see everything you need to know. Even though this is an old photograph that's been photographed, uh, photocopied many times, you can see the cell here. There's a rod coming down the middle. This little area down here is actually the plates. The plates are horizontal, not vertical. This is a pickle jar. That's his cell. It's pressurised too. This pump pressurises air into this cell. It wipes off some of the uh, positive and negative ions in the liquid and sends them up into this cleaning system here. Uh, this is his cleaning system, so is his sodium hydroxide doesn't get into the engine and start damaging it. Right in the front here is his carburetor, nothing fancy, just an ordinary carburetor that he pokes the gas into, uh, modifies it so as he can put the gas into the carburetor. That's basically the Archie Blue system. There is another one that I'll just show you before we finish with him. What Archie Blue uses is aluminium plates. They do break down with energy density, with electrolyte concentration and with heat generation as well. So well, how that will work is with this formula here. For every two moles or every two measures of aluminium that is broken down in the cell from those plates, it will generate three measures or three moles of diatomic hydrogen. This cell is very easy to replace. You just pull the whole thing out and just slap a few more discs onto this centre bar here that provides the air into the cell. This is diffused down the bottom here. He also has a heater. The more heat he applies to that cell, the quicker the aluminium breaks down and the more gas he will generate. In addition to that, the battery is connected to the system here and the negative is connected to here. These are a parallel configuration in the cell. By the way, remember I said they don't fill up the cell. This is just a schematic. The cells only come to less than one quarter of the height of that cell. From the DC application, from this battery, he will also generate diatomic hydrogen and diatomic oxygen, which also goes through this other pump into the carburetor and down into the engine. In addition to that, the pump is blowing air through this cell. It's cleaning off some of these plates from the immature gases. So you've got HOH gas also going into this pump, into the carburetor and down into the engine you have a real pea soup of gases that are in this particular engine. Is it any wonder that this was able to power a 1.2 litre engine? In America, he went over to get his patent. And before he got his patent in America, he tried to convert a Toyota 2 litre vehicle. He had the press, not only from America, but from England and uh, from France and I think from New Zealand was already there. It wouldn't run the Toyota because it was a two litre engine. It would only run a 1.2 litre engine. So you can see that whatever he was doing here was only enough for that smaller motor. Okay, we finished him. Here you can see Charles Garrett uh, holding the cell in his hand. This is a Ford motor uh, built between 1924 and 1928 and I got told off the other day for calling it a 1000cc motor uh, by an enthusiast who turned around and said that particular motor is 750 cc's so I stand corrected. I don't know whether that's true or not but somebody did say that. It was put into another chassis but that's no importance in respect of this. So as it says up the top this vehicle was driven in the Dallas area between 1934 and 1937 a Garrett claimed to have ran the motor continuously for 48 hours, so it is reliable. 
He said that he started instantly, ran cool and meant vehicle specifications regarding power and speed. So using hydrogen, it was just as good as using petrol. The electrodes are lead and the electrolyte is sulfuric acid. The volume of the cell is two litres and everybody has one of these in their car. Can anybody tell me what component in their car it is? Exactly what it is, yes, a car battery. These three electrodes here are all joined together. They form like one electrode. These three electrodes here are all joined together. They form the other electrode. And I couldn't understand what this damn divider was doing down the middle because what he does is collect all the gas from here, all the gas from here, and put it up into the engine. This device replaces your carburetor. It goes directly to the input manifold of the vehicle. When vacuum goes on this top end here, it draws, opens this little lid and draws up the gas into the venturi, into the input manifold. If the vacuum is too great for the amount of gas that is generated in this cell, there's a bypass cell uh, valve here that allows the air to come in from the outside air if there's not enough gas produced down here. But obviously, if it is a vacuum, it will put vacuum on this cell. And the last thing you want in your engine is sulfuric acid. So what he does, like very similar to Archie Blue, he adds an atmospheric tube here full of holes down the bottom. So every time he sets up a vacuum, this not only neutralizes the vacuum, but draws off some of the gas into the venturi, the immature gas that is not yet uh, develop the uh, H2 or O2 status. In addition to that, it's not only a DC system, which you see he's using a battery down here, but he's switching it over. It is also an AC system, a very slow AC system, because in those days he didn't have electronic components, he used a worm drive, he used this cog here, and every now and again it will switch over from one set of electrodes to the other. So this is anode, this is cathode, this is anode, periodically. The beauty about this is, as we said before, if this is a cathode, we have our hydrogen positive ions sticking to these electrodes. Switch it, positive. Kicks off the hydrogen positive ions. The air from down here sweeps it clear, takes it up into the venturi. But there's a much more important reason why he switched that backwards and forwards. Now this is a little bit complicated, so I'll read it. When power is applied, the cell acts like a lead-acid battery under charge. When connected without the supply, it would act like a secondary battery. So if we disconnected this altogether, this would generate electricity. And like the Pacheco cell, it would also develop hydrogen. But he doesn't want to do that. If power is continually applied in one direction across the plates, lead peroxide forms on the anode due to oxidization of the lead, whilst the cathode remains clean. And obviously, if we're going to oxidize the uh, anode, we're not going to get any more gas. It's going to stop producing. If the electrolyzer is allowed to discharge, the reaction is not reversible. Instead, the lead peroxide is converted to lead sulfate, which is PBSO4, and the cathode also reacts with the sulfuric acid, becoming coated with lead sulfate. So both of the electrodes would become sulfated if instead of reversing the polarity, he simply turned it off and pulsed it. It would ruin the cell. In this state, the cell can no longer conduct ions. When power is reapplied, the electrode connected to the positive terminal will once again be converted to lead peroxide, whilst the lead sulfate on the negative electrode will be removed to return the electrode to its original lead state. And you can understand by now, I think, that by pulsing that at perfect positions, you can always maintain it so as there is conduction uh, between those two systems and therefore producing hydrogen. Not only that, he conserves the energy. 
when he applies it here. Half the energy goes to providing oxidisation on the anode. That in turn produces electricity when he reverses the terminal. So he gets twice as much gas for half the amount of energy because the energy and the uh, hydrogen is conserved in one way production. So it's an excellent system. He drove that vehicle for about 15 months on and off around the Dallas area. Then all of a sudden it disappeared. Nobody ever heard of it again. When his father died at his eulogy, there was not one me word mentioned about the hydrogen vehicle. And the same when uh, young Garrett died. Not one word about this hydrogen vehicle. Nobody knows what happened to it. And here you have a vehicle that was running on hydrogen without any trouble, according to him. He maintained it for 48 hours. It was over unity. It was over unity. He was powering its own cell to drive its own vehicle. Here you have an over unity device. The same as Archie Blues. Next one we're going to talk about is Puriac. Puriac cell is hardly worth talking about. But we will talk about it because a lot of people uh, swear by this guy. He thinks he's absolutely marvellous. Even I thought a great deal about him before I started to look into what he was actually doing. The electrode here and another electrode here down the middle. He uses AC power, so we can't call one an anode and one a cathode. He puts uh, salt water in this tube which comes out just here. Uh, this is the cell itself, this device around about here. This in the middle here is a tube of Pyrex glass. A smaller tube of Pyrex glass is up the top. He puts that in this cell because he only wants it to conduct across this area on the surface of the electrolyte. Over a period of 30 minutes he generated 16 point cubic centimetres of HOH gas. Big deal. He used 180 joules to do that. Without going into a lot of detail, we'll get rid of this in a hurry. We'll simply say that 23.4 cc's of gas could be generated with 180 joules using the thermodynamic value uh, that is laid down in the textbooks. Therefore, this cell only produces 69% efficiency. It was claimed that he drove around America and across the mountains. Obviously with this sort of production he wasn't going to do any good at all with 69%. There was no quality in this gas that would have made it better than any other particular gas and I very much doubt that he did drive a vehicle anywhere powered by this device. One of the funny things about this device is it only works this way up. Yet it's shown in here that it has a screw thread for screwing into your spark plug holder. What would happen to the water then? A little tip outside, upside down. I can't understand what he was doing with that particular device. There's certainly no efficiency that would be worthwhile in any internal combustion engine. Now we're going to talk about Stan Meyer. Stan Meyer of Baton did three varying systems for powering a vehicle. But prior to his death, he refined all these ideas into a single vehicle system with possible applications in the aviation and space industry. There is no proof that this system was capable of powering a vehicle for sustained operation. It was reported that he powered a dune buggy with this device but was unable to meet engine demands over long periods. In fact, he just drove a few metres down the street and the thing used to conk out. And he did supplement it with another cell on board that particular dune buggy uh, to get a bit more run out of it. What Stan Myers had tried to do is use the natural frequency of a linear oscillating circuit, and I repeat that, a linear oscillating circuit to shake a stressed and polarised water molecule into its component parts. He attempted to achieve this by using distilled or deionised water in the cell and included in the circuit a capacitive component which was the cell. And we better have a look at his system before we go any further. Good, we're not very interested in all of this rubbish over here because this just provides 
a oscillating DC circuit so as he can fire up his primary of his transformer. And we're not even interested in this device and I won't even discuss it. What we are interested in is in this part of the circuit in that square. This is a secondary coil of the transformer. There's another coil over here and another coil down here which has an adjustment on it so as you can adjust the frequency of that particular circuit. Also included in this circuit is the cell itself. One electrode is an anode there and the other one is a cathode. Providing he use, uses deionized or distilled water, that will act as a capacitor because it has a high resistance. As I said before, 78 to 81 times the resistance that you would find in air of the same dimensions. What do you think will happen when he starts to generate some gas in that cell? Won't the water start to break down? Wouldn't you think that would be the case? I certainly do. But what are the point I'm trying to make here is that this is a series circuit. Right? Everything is connected one after the other in series. So that's all I want to talk about that at the moment because in linear oscillating circuits they are designed for maximum current flow in order to achieve maximum electrical oscillation. We need maximum current flow, otherwise it doesn't oscillate. It won't break apart the water molecule unless you can oscillate it. Unfortunately, Stan Myers' system is unable to take advantage of this ideal result. If Myers allowed a high amperage to be applied across the capacitor, it would strip some of the chrome, nickel and iron from the stainless steel plates that he used and contaminate the water. This would result in a breakdown of the dielectric properties of the water and the cell could no longer function as a capacitor. Like all capacitors, when they have a short in, you have to throw them away. It doesn't work. If Myers, on the other hand, provided high resistance across the secondary circuit to prevent a high amperage draw, in other words, if he made those coils of stainless steel wire, this coil and that coil of stainless steel wire, so as he could cut back his amperage, what oscillation is he going to get? Then the wattage output across the capacitor cell would be too low to be of any real value in separating the gases. So he's damned if he does and damns if he doesn't. The cell just doesn't work in that particular format. However, when the cell does break down, it starts to produce some sort of gas as a result of ordinary pulsed electrolytic action. So it will work, but it won't work the way he intended it. Because of the lack of research and development documentation, there is no solid public evidence to indicate the success or failure of his research. He put out thousands of pages on this. And a book called The Hydrogen Fracturing Process, and that was published by Stan, attempted to describe the system in detail unfortunately he provided no specific information that would allow anyone to duplicate his work. However, he did give away some information in his first patent and I've included that in the lecture notes with this uh, talk. Uh, by the way, there are other people besides me who are saying that. Peter Lindemann, who was the editor of Borderland Science in America, uh, he just recently gave a lecture and I'm told that he said exactly the same thing as I did, that it wouldn't work. We'll have a look now to see what, in fact, Myers had tried to do but didn't achieve. On July the 1st, 1940, Tacoma Narrow Bridge, just outside of Washington, was completed and opened to traffic. Just four months later, a mild gale set the bridge oscillating until the main span broke up, ripping loose the cables and crashing it into the water below. The wind produced a fluctuating resultant force which he was trying to do with his electric circuit in resonance with the natural frequency of the structure this caused a steady increase in the amplitude until the bridge was destroyed so that's what he was trying to do uh, he was trying to break the water molecule like that bridge was broken up simply by a small breeze but he didn't achieve it and the reason he didn't achieve it 
was because he didn't use a parallel oscillating circuit. And he wasn't using voltage, he was trying to use amperage. In November of 2005, the US Patent Office published a provisional patent on behalf of Stanley Meyer's brother, Stephen. The real brains behind the Stan Meyer patent was actually his brother. Stephen was an electronics engineer in the military and designed all of the circuits for Stan Meyer's devices. It is therefore interesting to note that although he would have propriety rights to Stan's patents, he had abandoned all of these devices in favour of a resonance system where the cell was used as an antenna rather than a capacitor and the water used as a resonant medium rather than a dielectric. So let's have a look at the provisional patent that Meyer put in last November. I think this has a good chance of being a worthwhile cell to build. And everybody in this room who has some electronic knowledge can build this without any problems. Because all the components are listed here on the circuit. This is the cell. Stan Myers, first of all, built a cell with concentric tubes, a number of them, within the cell. He's followed the same sort of idea here with this device. All of these cards are identical circuits. They're all down here. All of these three on this side, these three concentric tubes, are connected to one uh, alternator. He also put another alternator on the other side to try and double his gas output. He did a crafty little thing here. Instead of using just two tubes, like his brother used, he decided to use three. Why did he use three? Because this is a 50% duty cycle. Rather than waste 50% of the time, he switched it over to another tube. So he got half on the outside tube, half of the energy on the inside tube, and this one, uh, one step out from the middle is the neutral tube, which he connects down here to the neutral side of this three-phase device. The other side comes through here, goes through a parallel uh, circuit using a capacitor and using two coils, 1.7 millihenry coils over here. So he has a parallel oscillating circuit. And for the first time, we've got out of Myers an actual result of an experiment. Thank God for an oscilloscope. There you can see why he got a 50% duty cycle. When he first turns it on and the capacitors start discharging, you see how it drops. Then he turns it off, switches it on to the other one, and he produces this again. Because of these different amplitudes between each turning, that is the result of the water breaking down in this particular system. This would be like his brother's, unless, of course, he circulated the electrolyte, which is exactly what he does. He filters it, circulates it, subtracts the gas from it, and now he has a really viable system. Do you think it would drive a car? I'm not real sure whether it's going to drive a car. Because the patent was classified as a hydroxyl filling station. Whether he was trying to hide the fact that it did run a vehicle, or whether he tried to run a vehicle and couldn't and decide to cover his losses and say let's put it in a service station and start making gas night and day and you can pull up to the pump and you can get your hydroxy gas because that's going to produce hydroxy. But didn't I tell you before, if you pressurise this stuff, it's going to blow up? So how can he store it? How can he transfer it into the engine of a car? He can't do that because as soon as he tries to put it through a line, it's going to blow up again. However, there is a patent last century when you put uh, hydrogen and oxygen combined gas through petrol or through uh, turpentine or through diesel, it actually makes it a little more quieter to use. It can be compressurised under those circumstances. And when you combine it back into water, it doesn't have uh, the same amount of pollution that you would put out uh, if you use petrol. So it's a good way of using hydroxy gas, 
but he hasn't used that in that device and it would be a worthwhile proposition if he did. Natural resonance of the output circuit is matched in this particular case by controlling the speed of the alternators. Notice the coils don't have any taps on them. They're straight coils. So he controls this with the alternator, speed of the alternators themselves. When both alternators and the output circuitry at our common frequency, the system is designed to break down the water in the antenna system. To avoid electrically contaminating the water medium, it is continually circulated and filtered, and I'll put some additional details in the notes for those people who are interested. Okay, let's get rid of him. We've gone through a few tonight. We've given you at least two possibles that could power your vehicle so far, with a possible third. Now we're going to talk about Mr. Horvath in Sydney. And we'll discuss him on a couple of occasions during this evening. Horvath was a genius who lived in New South Wales and devoted his life to developing a pollution-free onboard system to power a vehicle. Unfortunately, there is no proof that Horvath ever ran a car using only an onboard hydrolyzer. He lost his credibility when he got involved with Bianchi Peterson, who was a Queensland Premier at the time, to demonstrate a water-powered car. But when uh, it came to the crunch and they had all the publicity there, uh, the whole thing failed and poor old Horvath lost his credibility. However, just because that vehicle didn't work didn't mean he was any less of a genius. Up here we see his first invention. You notice the electromagnet down the centre, which is insulated from the water bath. Uh, this is a concentric system. The anode is shown here. It's not very clear, but there is an anode tube here made out of stainless steel. There's a, a cathode tube around the outside, and the water is just in this skinny little bit area here. Actually, that is made sodium hydroxide. You use sodium hydroxide, I think. Didn't we have it here somewhere? Yes, we did, anyhow. Uh, he put about 66 amps across that system. And if you can see down the bottom line here, he used 121 kilowatt hours to generate 1,000 standard cubic feet of gas. And if we compare that to the Faraday system, we see we would only need 80.5 kilowatts to generate the same 1,000 cubic feet of gas at 100% efficiency. So the cell only operates at 67% efficient. And that is why Horvath threw the damn thing out. But he didn't throw it out completely. What he did was took out the electromagnet out the middle and instead he put a gamma radiation device similar to what they have in the hospitals for generating x-rays. There's a spark gap here between two tungsten electrodes. He put 40,000 volts across this system. He tried to make his water and separated up into hydrogen and oxygen using this system and again he was defeated. But not down. So what he did, he ran off to his local Commonwealth Industrial Gas Place. He picked up a bottle of hydrogen and he put his hydrogen gas through this system, radiating it with 40,000 volts of gamma radiation. And lo and behold, this one single device could totally revolutionise the hydrogen industry. Why? Because it produces a thermal efficiency of 38.89% compared to a lousy 17.87% for a V8 Ford engine using petrol. Let's see how our values panned out for a real test carried out by an independent authority. For petrol at 40 miles per hour equivalents, 1,500 RPM, it used 2.2 imperial gallons, or 10 litres. On the hydrogen basis, we use 720 cubic feet, which comes out to 5.7 litres per second. 5.7 litres per second. Uh, remember right back in part one, we said 3.4 litres uh, on a theory basis 
uh, for a two-liter engine. Here we have a V8 engine with 5.7 liters, which makes our theory seem very, very good, as though it's right on the button. So for a two-liter engine, 3.4. For a V8, approximately 5.7. How do you think he got this energy? He's got ordinary old hydrogen. He puts it in an engine. We know from all our studies tonight that we're only going to get 15 to 20 percent efficiency out of that. We've got 40 percent. Gamma radiation of the fuel creates highly ionised hydrogen and transmutation of the elements appears to be involved. Normal H2 combustion would yield 15 to 25 percent thermal efficiency. Exhaust showed 18 parts per million helium compared to 5.2 parts per million for the air intake. An excess of 12.8 parts per million, or as I said before earlier in the evening, 350% increase in the thermal efficiency. Why on earth would you want to use petrol if you can get such a thermal efficiency using hydrogen that's been radiated? Because it won't produce any bad effects from radiation as long as you keep the cell uh, surrounded by lead won't do any harm whatsoever. And when it goes out of the exhaust, what have you got? Just water vapour. And helium does absolutely no damage whatsoever. So now you can see that if you have bottled hydrogen on your vehicle, you can run hydrogen at a much greater efficiency than you can ever run petrol. So the next one's a bit of a come down from that. Chambers Ortho Para Hydrogen Hydrolyzer. All right, what the hell is Ortho Para Hydrogen? We've talked about deuterium, tritium, and protium. We've talked about HOH gas, and now we've got a new term, Ortho and Para Hydrogen. The official definition is down here. Hydrogen isomers differ in their magnetic interaction of the proton due to the spinning motion of the proton. In Ortho Hydrogen, the spin of both protons in the diatomic dumbbell, because don't forget hydrogen is like a dumbbell, it has the two atoms at either side with a sort of bar going down the middle, that's how we demonstrate it. And they are parallel, they rotate in the same direction. In para hydrogen, the spin is diametrical and called anti-parallel. Normally both types may be regarded as completely independent, however under temperature change at equilibrium, or under stress conditions, they may interconvert. At minus 231.1 degrees centigrade, para hydrogen is 99.82% pure. At 200 degrees centigrade, twice the temperature of steam, it is 25% para hydrogen to ortho hydrogen mix. It is conclusive, therefore, that ortho hydrogen can never have a concentration greater than 75%. It can never be pure. Let's have a look see what our invention's all about. Chambers device uses plain water from the tap. Doesn't use any electrolyte. Although there is a bit of conduction in the tap water, which there's a lot of impurities in that. And a closed plate gap of one millimetre to five millimetres. Actually, I think he used about two in his cell and can have as many as 40 plates in parallel. Here's his plate system here. Uh, they can be concentric, like in the Joe cell, or they can be flat, uh, like in the Brown cell. The lower part of this circuit, and we're referring to this circuit here, produces 10 to 250 kilohertz square wave frequency with a mark space ratio, that means turning it on and turning it off, of 10 to 1 and a potential of 12 volts, outputting just 300 milliamps to the cell. The closed cell is capable of a gas production with a pressure of 1 psi per minute, and I've got no idea what that means, because he did not give us a volume output of the gas, so we're unable to assess this cell to see how good it is. The coil which you see here the coil above the plates, uh, produces, according to him, some uh, para-hydrogen. Its uh, frequency is between 17 and 22 hertz, and he said it has an average of 19 hertz 
Don't forget the bottom part of this circuit, the plates between 10 and 250 kilohertz. The coil, on the other hand, is approximately 19 hertz. And it gets that 19 hertz from this end counter here. If you put maybe uh, 10 or 100 pulses in here, this device is designed to give you one pulse out here. These triple five devices are excellent tools to use for an experimenter. Uh, they can give you a constant frequency. You can adjust them to any frequency. Uh, it can give you what we call a one shot. Uh, if you put a pulse in like we're doing here, it will give you a pulse out. That pulse can last for some uh, particular time depending on how you arrange this triple five timer. And you can see your coil here in the circuit of the output of this transistor and here's your plates here in the circuit of the output of this system here in these three transistors. Uh, this system was hijacked by a system called the Heisel. They plagiarised it and said it was there. He didn't really say it was his own device, but he never gave any credit to this guy. Uh, what he did was change a bit of this circuitry. He put in MOSFETs instead of transistors, and that, that's about the only change he made. And he said, oh, this will run a car, no problem, if you read his book. Actually, what's that? Hydrostar, that's right, Hydrostar. And here's a coil from the Hydrostar uh, system that I've had made up. That's the coil up there. The, this inventor claimed that he ran a single cylinder uh, four stroke motor on this particular device. Uh, didn't say whether he was using this power rating here to run the engine, but he simply said that he ran a single cylinder motor on this. And I don't know whether that's right or wrong because. He's a little bit wrong what he says down here. The claim is that only ortho hydrogen is produced between the plates. But didn't we just say that you can't make more than 75%? It can't ever be made purely. So first of all, he's made a mistake there. And he's also claimed that para hydrogen is created, or mainly para hydrogen is created by the coil. If we correctly balance these according to that inventor, we can control the burn rate of the fuel. More para hydrogen, slower burn rate. More ortho hydrogen, faster burn rate. So by balancing those two, we can determine the burn rate for that particular cell. I don't want to discuss any more about it because we've got a couple more to before we finish off. So. Here's the Hassabi system which I spoke about earlier this evening looks very complex. What it consists of are two permanent magnets. The poles are facing inwardly. The poles are facing inwardly. There's one magnet. There's the other magnet. They're not electromagnets. They're just plain, ordinary, old magnets. Ferrite, I think they were, used in his cell. He closed the magnetic circuit here and he closed the magnetic circuit there. What he doesn't say in the patent is whether this magnet at the bottom is the same uh, orientation as the top magnet. So the bottom magnet might be south here and north here. Or it could be they're both north over this side and they're both south over that side. He didn't say in the patent. Uh, what he's done here is similar to what I did in the first drawing with Pacheco. He's put it through this device here. So this is a pump. This is uh, pumping uh, the electrolyte around in this cell. He uses uh, sodium hydroxide. So he pumped the electrolyte around here. The gas went off up the top, went into this bubbler, from the bubbler to its intended application. The plates themselves, there's only two of them, but they're coiled up like a coil. So he has the advantage of a spiral electrical system here, as well as two flat plates uh, one cathode and one anode. He doesn't do anything fancy. He just runs 30 amps through this particular device and he claims an output of 417.6 litres of HOH gas for each hour. If I applied the Faraday law to this, we would get only 20.8 litres for the same period of time and for the same amount of amperage. 2,006% over and above the Faraday benchmark. 
I hope to God he's telling the truth because if he does, we've got a cell here that you can put on your car without any trouble to operate that without petrol. It will operate, as I said down here, this particular cell on this claim will operate a 45cc uh, motor but it's only drawing 84 watts. You can draw a hell of a lot more than that out of an alternator, certainly enough to be able to run an ordinary small four-cylinder motor with the amount that you can draw off an alternator. So as I said, let's hope he's telling the truth and this isn't a lie. Les Bankey and his crew are currently uh, trying to recreate that particular cell and I hope that sometime later we can find out what those results are. We're finished now, there's one more to go. Just one more to go, I left the piece to resistance till last. We're back to Mr Horvath, as I said, our genius. He got sick and tired of taking away the electricity from his alternator and from taking away from the lousy 20% he had to drive his vehicle. He said, why the hell should I do that? I can drive another four vehicles with what goes out of the exhaust, or actually what goes to the waste. About twice as much goes out of the exhaust as you use to drive your vehicle, a little bit over twice. So what he's done is made a, a device in the shape of an exhaust, of a muffler system. He took off his muffler and he put this on. It still would have quietened your engine exactly the same as any muffler would, so that's an advantage. He brings the gas in here. This is his output from his output manifold. Uh, he mixes a little bit of water vapour as it comes out of his output manifold so he can turn that to superheated steam as it comes out of the exhaust. And he pokes it in this end here. That's the exhaust here. The gases come out of here. And he makes hydrogen. And hydrogen comes out of this tube here. How does he do that? Because normal exhaust from petrol is 750 degrees or thereabouts centigrade. That 750 degrees centigrade is enough temperature to separate hydrogen and oxygen from stream with a catalytic process. We have here, as it says here, superheated steam coming in from our exhaust. That goes between this pink tube which is made of palladium. Concentrically and external to that is a tube of iron, cast iron on the outside. As this gas goes between these two tubes, the hydrogen is drawn in to the palladium. That hydrogen then goes out through this tube. The oxygen, what happens to that? It loves iron. It is sucked into the iron of magnetic iron oxide, or known for short as magnetite. But what will happen once it becomes saturated? It'll stop. The whole thing's a waste of time. But if we were to take a little bit of hydrogen off here, just about 5 or 10%, we drill a hole in here and we put a little jet in here, as well as another little hole uh, to put a, a glow plug, we set light to this little bit of hydrogen and that will burn up all the oxygen on the outside of our iron. And when it burns up all of that oxygen, the temperature here increases to about 1,000 degrees centigrade. There is a temperature differential between the input and the output of that iron. And seeing as magnetite iron oxide is a reversible process, when there is a temperature differential, the oxygen just falls out of the iron maintain a continuous process here in this device. So he's manufacturing all the hydrogen he wants with twice the power that he's putting to the wheels of his vehicle. More than enough hydrogen than you would ever need because at 750 degrees this palladium can absorb for every single atom of palladium it will absorb 3,000 atoms of hydrogen on a continuous basis. What's coming out of our exhaust? Well, if we mix hydrogen in here, isn't that going to turn to superheated steam? So we have water vapour coming out of our exhaust. What else do we have coming out of our exhaust? Well, the free hydrogen. So out of our exhaust, instead of pollution, 
we have water vapour, very, very clean, and we, have, and we have oxygen, pure oxygen coming out of that exhaust. Nobody needs to put sewage through their water supply faucet because we now have all the water we need coming out of the exhaust, going back into the atmosphere, providing all the water we need. Uh, with good uh, rainfalls, we have all the oxygen we need, we can replace the oxygen that we've been burning for the last 200 years back into the atmosphere with this type of device. What's more, we've got free hydrogen to operate our engine. What's more, this is a muffler, it's going to keep your motor quiet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the last device that I can show you tonight. Thank you very much for putting up with me for the last three hours. <laughs> <laughs>